Welcome to Agile to Agility Podcast with Milan Bayic. Major show alert. The very first value we wrote is individuals and interactions. Let's take this to another level. I hope that people can uh, really realize this software needs a holistic approach, and that's a really good way to, to tackle it. So who is Lisa Crispin and what's been your journey? That's the... Well, I, I had a big milestone this month, uh, January of 2022. I've been in the software business 40 years. Started as a programmer trainee that many years ago. So it's been interesting because I was really lucky with my first team. Uh, a lot of what we did, you would call agile today. So it's been a real interesting journey to see What's changed in software development? What's kind of stayed the same? Uh, so I got into testing back in the early 90s and, and really enjoyed that. And got into extreme programming in 2000 and never looked back. And it's like, okay, this is, this is what works for me and my teams. And, um, and was really eager to make that safe for testers because the early extreme programming leaders just felt like they didn't need any stinking testers. Uh, and so I felt like I, I could help show Janet Gregory who I met back then, and I could help show what we value that we could add and, and really turn that around and share our experiences and talk to people around the world and share their experiences through our books and our our conference workshops and, and courses and things like that. So just trying to spread these ideas that really the whole team is responsible for quality and, and testing occurs all the way around. You know, now we have that DevOps loop model, which is really uh, great to show software is a continuous thing. And, and our approach to testing is holistic. There's testing in, in all parts of software development and it just keeps going around and around. And uh, so, uh, yeah, just trying to, keep spreading that and um and i live on a little farm in vermont with some donkeys and dogs and cats and and my nice husband who puts up with all that so um yeah nice and i know you uh, uh, your love for donkeys i'm interested like uh uh how how did that develop and well, I, I had horses all or my life. Animals, I, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I had horses, grew up riding horses. And yeah. um, and uh, at one point I was leasing a, a dressage horse uh, from a friend and uh, she had a little farm and her neighbor rescued some miniature donkeys. And mm -hmm. she said, I'm going to take one of these miniature donkeys. And I just rolled my eyes. I'm like, what would you do with a donkey? <laughs> and of course, as soon as I saw the donkey, I fell in love. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And of course, the donkeys come in pairs. They need a donkey companion, so got another donkey. And uh, and then when my husband and I moved to our own horse property or equine property uh, with the two little mini donkeys, we realized that they're vulnerable to coyotes, and there were lots of coyotes. And so mm -hmm. we adopted a standard size donkey to protect them. A standard female donkey a jenny uh -huh. and uh, she kept the coyotes away and and uh yeah so that's how we ended up with all these donkeys and they all they they all do work they all drive pull carts <laughs> pull wagons do work around the farm they love to work um uh -huh. and we also have a, a a guest a permanent guest donkey from mm -hmm. a nearby farm her her companion donkey died she's 34 years old she was all by herself and so they were happy for her to come along and be part of our herd. So, yeah, um, yeah they, is, they I get... love. Yeah, I love donkeys. Uh, my wife is from Montenegro, and it's, I, mm -hmm. I think donkey is there, <laughs> protected the animal, and uh, because Montenegro is, uh, you know, full of very rocky mountains, uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, donkeys are very practical uh in a sense or at least back in the day they were uh, but thank you I, i'm just interested because like you have the donkey logo on your mm -hmm. uh a uh, uh, lot of your new stuff and things like right. that. And, uh, yeah and and it's interesting because i've learned a lot about uh, from donkeys that applies to my work um unlike 
horses, donkeys really work on trust. If a donkey doesn't trust you, you cannot make a donkey do anything, which is why they get the reputation of being stubborn. Uh, um, they're very, they're looking out for number one. <laughs> and I mean, that's a good lesson with people too. If, if we can all trust each other on a team, there's no limit to what we can do because then we're free to explore and experiment and disagree because we trust each other to, to have the team's best interest at heart and, and each other's best interest. And so we can, you know, we can grow and discuss and, and, uh, really get in the trenches so um yeah so i, I try yeah. to keep my eyes open to what i can learn from the donkey <laughs> great and that trust is uh you know kind of key to everything right it doesn't matter what you're doing or what you know it seems like it's uh it, it's a stepping stone for a lot of things that we want to do in life at work uh whatever right um mm -hmm. maybe to come back i'm interested you said you know 40 40 years mm-hmm that, that that's a lot um in the sense that i turn 40 i'm gonna turn 40 uh in may <laughs> i've been a programmer uh, since before you were a, a gleam yeah. in your parents eye uh, yeah <laughs> it, 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 no but it's like it's a lot of knowledge so like i, I would like to uh kind of you know uh, hear your thoughts what has changed what has stayed the same like what lessons should we be or are we repeating and in what ways uh, you know have things kind of evolved in a better way well i i think that i was really fortunate my first team uh, i was worked for the data processing division at university of texas and they they hired subject matter experts and trained them mm -hmm. to write code and so we all wrote code the same way so we had collective code ownership we could all work on each other's code we all work together but what was really key was we worked so closely with our customers and our customers were professors administrative staff you know the university departments building the library circulation system the library online catalog the registration system so all these really important automating all these things that had been done manually up to that point and um you know we really literally sat down and and showed our customers that here's a prototype uh, how does this work for you? How does this form work? How does this report work? Uh, what are you going to do with this data? You know, what's the purpose? And that's what we do today in agile teams. <laughs> but, uh, you know, my, at one point after that, I got into more of a waterfall. We didn't even know what waterfall was when I started. And I don't think it, I think it was maybe just starting back in the early eighties. And, I got into a project where it's like very strict waterfall and yeah. you know we wrote a requirements document this thick and uh and nobody nobody really nobody on the customer side even read it because yeah. it was so long in fact we found out that the project lead he had a big the most important part of it because he was supposed to be the expert and we found out he just put blank pages in the report for his part <laughs> <laughs> but the customer signed off uh -huh. Uh, you know, and so clearly that was not a good approach. Now, I've also worked on good waterfall teams where we work continuously very closely with the customer, but we had a product, you know, in that case, it was a database software company. And this was the early 90s. We or early to mid 90s. We only released a new version every six months to a year. So it was OK to take a while, but we all worked together testers, designers, developers, product people, even though we were doing it in phases. So um, we had continuous integration. We had test automation. We had automated deploys because we supported 20 some odd Unix environments. Um, you know, these practices are not new and high performing teams always did them. Yeah. Uh, you know, we had source code control. You know, we were just very very modern in those in those senses and, and and again you know having that trust mm -hmm. uh having that sense of psychological safety where we could all work together and have really great leadership um and so that you know but the problem was when you got into web startups <laughs> yeah. that that delay didn't work anymore so um so so getting to extreme programming and seeing oh these some of these things i'm used to some of the I love the focus on people. When mm -hmm. I read Kent Beck's book, X XP Explain, it's all about people. It's all about quality. It's about continuously testing. It's about working with the customers. And so, uh, you know, I think those concepts have 
stayed the same. And from a technology point, I'm, you know, I'm not such a tech, technical or technology person that Mary Poppendieck yeah. has a really great talk that she does because she's got even longer experience I have to yeah. say even the technology in a lot of senses of the concepts are not changing that much just we have better technology but working on the same principles so um yeah I was lucky to learn good lessons from the start and be able <laughs> yeah. to apply those and you know I've been on some not so great teams too so I you know I've experienced the unicorn magic and I've experienced the dark side. <laughs> uh, uh, but it seems like, I mean, like if, if these practices have been along the, the ideas or, uh, you know, what it takes to have a high performing team, it's nothing new, but it, it's when we look at the, you know, a lot of organizations, a lot of teams today, um, those ingredients are missing or we're not mm -hmm. seeing. Uh, why do you think that is? Is it just the, the scale? Is it just the speed? The, um, does it go back to trust and uh, or how we set up teams? What do you think it is that is kind of crippling a lot of organizations today? I, you know, unfortunately, I just think it's a lot of kind of it's dysfunction that's caused by leaders having a different agenda. They're not out to build the best software teams and build the best software. They're out to make a whole boatload of money. You know, I think part of it is our, at least in the U.S., our economy, our stock market, it rewards short-term performance. It rewards quarterly results. And, you know, one of, the, one of the first agile teams I was on, um, it was a startup. It took a couple of years before we really mastered the skills we needed to you know, deliver value really frequently and, you know, achieve continuous delivery. And um, our, our co-founders were willing to make that investment, mm -hmm. but most of them aren't. They want the quick payback, you know, the quick exit strategy. Mm -hmm. And then once they go to try to IPO, you know, the goals are all different. And what I've experienced a few times is, um, you know, the company decides to IPO, they bring in a whole new te leadership team <laughs> who who has this formula. You know, they're going to implement safe or they're going to implement scrum. They're going to implement something. They don't even look at what the teams are doing now, yeah. but they have their formula for scaling up and making a quick, you know, growing quickly. Who knows what's going to happen after that? It doesn't really matter because once they IPO, you know, Maybe they'll move on to the very next fun. company. They're going to help. <laughs> I don't know. It's a very cynical outlook. I, I, and I don't think they're all that way, but yeah. I just see a lot of rather than come in and, and talk to the team and say, what's working for you? What's not working? What's the biggest problem? They simply come in and say, this is what I do. And now you will be doing it. Yeah. So it's almost coercing people into certain ways of doing. And I think what you're alluding to, which a lot of people on this podcast have also alluded to it and said it's really the environment, uh, mm -hmm. leadership, leadership mindset, and the systems and environment that you're in mm -hmm. that's really creating this. So even though we know, uh, generally speaking, what it takes, small cross-functional teams that are willing mm -hmm. to learn, that are curious, um, uh, do that, and you'll be able to have uh, high-performing teams in most instances, but it's the environment that's holding people back. Yeah, and and you know, one of the I've learned a lot of important lessons from Linda Rising over the years, and one thing I've learned from her is, unfortunately, as humans, the way we evolved, uh, our decisions are not made on logic and data as a rule. You know, <laughs> so I've been on teams where even though we have the data that shows what we're doing produces the shortest cycle time and the best results. Leadership doesn't like that. They want us to do things a different way. They don't care about that data. And, uh, you know, it's, it becomes very difficult to influence because you have to be really clever about it. how can you influence people? Um, yeah. Because it goes back to the needs, I guess, human needs. And uh, mm -hmm. if you don't have psychological safety, you're mm -hmm. always, hey, you know, how am I uh, reaching my goals? Like you said, quarterly goals and all of that. Um, what else? Uh, reflecting back on the journey, like who, who, you know, what are some of the things that, uh, or maybe what are some of the things that you're seeing that you're excited about as far as uh, where we're going? Well, I, 
I have seen just a ton of positive things. I think I think people do realize that it's important to have testers on agile teams. Now, at the same time, I do see teams where, you know, they may be cut down on the number of testers, but that's because when they're successful, that's because everybody on the team has got that quality mindset of we're going to build quality in, we're going to prevent bugs. We have a we have a tester or two to teach us those skills that we don't have already and to be kind of our our advocate for quality and, and help us keep on track. Um, so I think the role of testers are changing, but I think they're really valued uh, in a lot of in a lot more places than they used mm -hmm. to be. It used to be the testers were the people in the corner going through those manual checks to make sure something was regression tested. And I, people see more value, uh, more more people in software development understand the value of uh, things like exploratory testing. Mm -hmm. that those are really, really important skills and that uh, it would pay for everybody to learn at least some some of those skills and mm -hmm. be able to learn about their product better and kind of discover those unknown unknowns before before they hit production and think more yeah. like their customers. At the same time, super excited about the technology we have that allows us to observe our systems in production because our systems have become so mm -hmm. complex. And so I've last few years, I've really learned a lot from people like Charity Majors and, and Abby Bangser and, and people in that space mm -hmm. of observability, asking questions of our production system when things are going wrong uh, or making just to make sure all our customers are having a good experience. And this is a mm -hmm. place where testing skills are really great to apply. We're great question askers. We're great at identifying risks. Uh, and, you know, we're great explorers and we can explore that production data and really learn a lot. And so the last few years, I've, I've tried to do what I can to help testers not be afraid of the right side of that DevOps <laughs> loop um, yeah. and and embrace as part of, as part of holistic testing of, you know, our skills are, we have to be involved all the way through. We have to understand yeah. what's happening in production and we have to get started as soon as somebody has a feature idea and start testing those feature ideas and, sure. and all the way around the loop. So I see those, that, you know, we have all these really great visual models now that help us think. And, you know, we didn't have those 20 years ago. Well, we started to have them 20 years ago, but uh. we didn't have them 25 years ago. Um, and then, you know, things like Brian Merrick's agile testing quadrants or, or Mike Cohn's test automation pyramid, you know, people can maybe dismiss them now as, oh, we have better things now. It's like, yeah, but at the time, those were important concepts that people did not understand. Right. And having those visual models to help people discuss them and learn them and apply them in their teams was so important. Um, so yeah. yeah, those things are exciting to me. Yeah, and you know, something that you said as far as like, you know, testers, testers, uh, be more respected, I think, uh, and being open uh, and understanding more about the the, the uh, development side. I think it's also a lot of times I I, I got this uh, guy Ronnie stuck in my head when he said once uh, he was a senior architect uh, and developer. He said like testing is below my pay grade. Uh, yeah, and it was like he, he was a great guy, but he was he was under a lot of pressure. Mm -hmm. And uh, in a sense, and he was thinking about what I need to do, what I need. And I think, you know, things are changing. That, that was, a you know, something that was uh, a mindset or general thing that you would run into. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think today, like, you, you, I'm seeing, like, business people understand the, the, the importance of quality testing and their investment. Because you have to invest in that, mm -hmm. right? It's not... Mm -hmm um what are your thoughts on that are you seeing that as well where uh, there's more of a holistic understanding on all sides of business the importance of testing um and not just as a side thing but you know actually start <laughs> with quality in mind and testing in mind yeah i mean i've been fortunate the the places i've been working the product people really do understand the need for that investment um, and, uh, you know, they're, they want it because they yeah. don't want a disaster in production. You know, it's, it's so competitive today. Businesses are so, most industries are so competitive. So, mm -hmm. you know, if you have one thing that 
causes a lot of customers pain, you're going to be in trouble. So yeah, they're, to they're, they're totally willing to do that. Um, and, and really even understanding how that has to go across the team. I was, uh, several years ago, I was working uh, for Pivotal Labs on the Pivotal Tracker Team, it was a project tracking tool. And mm -hmm. we were having a lot of trouble with problems in production. And we had, you know, three testers for 35 developers or something. It was not a good yeah. ratio. And the management, the development management realized we're lacking in exploratory testing. We're doing a great job of automated regression testing. We're doing a good job of test room development. We're doing all these great XP practices, but we're not taking the time to use our software, even though we dog fooded it. Uh, we're not taking the time to use our software in all the ways customers might use it. Mm -hmm. We're just taking a very narrow view. So we need the exploratory testing and we've got these testers who are good at it. So one thing they did, you know, I think a lot of times when developers have that attitude of that's below my pay grade, it's because they're being paid to write lines of production code and they're being mm -hmm. pressured to meet deadlines and don't slow down and do that testing, even though that would benefit in the long run. And so they actually uh, added, you know, they had a kind of a skills matrix for, for developers to advance in their career ladder. They mm -hmm. added exploratory testing skills to that <laughs> to that matrix. Yeah. So at level one, you had to have these skills, at level two, these skills. And then they asked us as testers, can you do workshops? Can you pair with the developers? Can you do ensemble sessions with the developers and just transfer those skills? And mm -hmm. the, the, the developers were motivated to do it because it was part of their job now. Uh -huh. And so the way we ended up doing it was that they would do some manual exploratory testing at the story level as they're working on the story. And then uh, the testers would collaborate with them and the product people to write exploratory testing charters, which were stories in our backlog, mm -hmm. along with the feature stories. And then when, it, when enough of an epic was done to start doing that more workflow end to end exploratory testing, then people would pair up across all roles and, and do that. And it worked so well. The, the, the production problems we had went way down and we were much more successful at mm. continuous delivery because we weren't rolling back all the time. <laughs> <laughs> but that's also, I think, it's something that you bring brought up, like pairing, like more mob programming. I know you're mm -hmm. a big fan uh, mm -hmm. of, of those practices, mm -hmm. but that's also something that we know it works in a sense and that it's very beneficial from so many different perspectives. Mm -hmm. Yet uh, it goes back to like uh, trying to look at short term goals. Um, mm -hmm. What are your thoughts when it comes to like implementing these practices in, in relation to managers that don't fully understand? Because like it's usually uh, the managers or people that are that could enable these type of behaviors that they're not truly uh, aware of the benefits uh, and how do you maybe you know get those managers and leaders to see the benefits of this whole team approach and then also benefits of um, you know maybe mob programming or pair programming the, you know the pair programming and mob programming it's just it's just such a tough sell if the CTO or whoever the leader is of the organization does not understand it yeah. and does not understand why, oh, it looks like multiple people are doing the same work and we don't have as many work streams and they don't get it that it shortens your cycle time. It reduces waste, rework, it improves quality so much that it's a huge benefit. And, and, and like learning I, too. I mean, it's a huge learning. It, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. And like I say, Data doesn't convince the ones that don't already understand it. Um, I don't know what it takes for them to understand it. Maybe if they came up through that and experienced mm -hmm. it themselves, they understand it. But I, I'm a little cynical and discouraged about that. Um, <laughs> we see these companies who've done it, you know, hunter, hunter Industries and co companies who've done it for years, Pivotal Labs, you know, we 100% pairing on the production code. You can see mm -hmm. the results. Um, and, and yet they think they know better. And I, you know, it's just this whole thing of business people hiring software people mm -hmm. and then trying to tell us how to do our job. It's like, no, no, you hired us because we know the best ways to do that. So just treat it as a black box and be happy uh -huh. <laughs> with what comes out. It's just like test driven development. You know, I've heard 
I can't point to a study, but I've heard and I could believe it that test, teams that practiced test driven development, and I've been on so many teams that did, that's why I know this is true, yeah. probably prevents like 80% of the bugs that most teams have. And I know as a tester, when I started working on teams doing test driven development, it was suddenly like, wow, <laughs> I'm not dealing with these unit level bugs anymore. I have a lot more time to do much more productive, exactly, uh, highly skilled testing. Um, it's discouraging. I think it's important to educate people, educate managers and executives why quality does matter. They all say, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, we want the highest quality, you know, mom and apple pie <laughs> and quality. What does that really mean to them? We have to translate that into, you know, their language. You know, what does this mm -hmm. impact them on a financial level? Yeah. I've had some success with that, but it was mostly at companies that were already more open-minded about it. Um, you know, Janet It's and also I like a lot, lot of managers, it's not tied to their incentives. So it's yeah. like, oh, you know, uh, I don't care. I mean, not, not that they don't care, but like in a sense, like a lot of times people know they're creating technical debt, but they need to mm. meet deadlines and like their deadlines yeah. are tied to their bonuses. So it's it's less about like, That's oh, how am right. I screwing the company over long term? Mm -hmm. It's like, well, I'm just doing my job and I'm trying to do what my boss is telling me to do. Right. Yeah. That kind of deadline pressure is just an unhealthy environment. Um, and you know, Janet and I have tried to convey in our books how people can educate executives there's a really good book leading quality by um, ronald cummings john and oase peer the it's a nice short book executives might read it uh but it's really they they came from a failed startup that failed because their quality was poor they were not testers <laughs> but they realized what happened and how important that was for businesses and so this book is really written in this is this is how you speak the language of the business and convey why this is important what it means. Uh, so that's a good book to read to, to see how you can influence. I use Mary Lynn Mann, Mann's and Linda Rising's patterns from fearless change and more fearless changes mm -hmm. trying to be an influencer. I think we all can be influencers, but it, in a large organization, it can be pretty daunting. Yeah. We have to keep trying, of course. Well, it's, it, I agree. And it, it, it's really just uh, getting everybody on the same page to understand, like, in a sense, like when we focus on quality, it, you know, the whole company benefits, the customers benefit. Um, and there's so many different things, but we have to be aligned. And I think that mm -hmm. alignment sometimes gets in the way. Um, so th that's, I think, something that, uh, you know, uh, it's always challenging same thing uh you know like uh, when we look at it from a process side uh there's a lot of uh you know well let's do scrum let's do this mm -hmm. without focusing on the technical side mm -hmm. and again if you don't have that holistic approach uh it, it's really gonna work in a sense if uh if you if your technical practices are not mature uh doing scrum won't do you any good or mm -hmm. anything else no and, and the other aspect of quality is you know, as testers we need to think about the quality at a, at a system level what are our customers experiencing mm -hmm. so now that so many people are moving towards a microservices type architecture you know my team right now is working on one part of the, the whole system right mm -hmm. we feel like our quality and our part is great it really is great <laughs> yeah. but if some other part of the product or system is bad or has problems it doesn't matter that ours is great because the customers will suffer so so myself and a few of the testers on other teams are trying to think like holistically yeah. how can we measure quality at the system level what is quality in the you know in our context what is quality at the system level mm -hmm. what are some ways we can measure it what are some experiments we can try to improve it and you know part of part of it is sometimes it's hard to measure you know mm -hmm. so maybe, maybe we can measure count the number of times that uh, a rollback happened in production or you know and people do bug counts i think bug counts are really misleading i don't really like to use them but maybe yeah. trends maybe trends in how many production bugs there are something like that um maybe we have so many great analytical tools uh, and mm -hmm. of course we have our monitoring tools we can look at our response time and latency, we can look at how customers, you know, our customer funnels, you know, we actually have tools to see how customers are using our UIs. Mm -hmm. 
and we can see where they're struggling. So we really have to do that, you know, systems thinking um, and and apply that and, and not just be concerned on our own. You know, I've been more, you know, I've worked <laughs> on smaller teams for smaller companies where we were doing the whole thing, working on just a service that's part of a bigger picture. That's a big challenge. Uh, does the definition of done, I mean, I'm assuming it helps in that instance, having consistent and strong definitions of done across teams that are working on different um, microservices, but I'm interested to hear your thought. You've just given me a great idea. I hadn't thought about <laughs> doing a definition of done yeah. at the system level, actually. Uh, so, yeah, so a lot, a lot of times, at least having that conversation, and I think it goes back to that holistic view of like, are we all on the same page as what it means to be <laughs> high quality or like, mm -hmm. you know, for every team to say what you just said, you know, uh, I think we're, uh, you know, our quality is, uh, you know, high. Um, I want to switch it up a little bit and ask you, like, in what ways is testing fun? Um, my favorite part of it is, and some people might not see this as testing, but uh, is helping people in different specialties and roles come to a shared understanding of a new feature mm -hmm. when we first start talking about building that feature. Um, I've been on, I've, I've experienced so many times working on a really great team. We did, we used the great practices. We built some wonderful software. It just wasn't what our customers wanted. <laughs> we thought we knew. Uh, and so I feel like as testers, we, we are most, you know, this is a bias of mine, but I think testers are, mostly big picture people we're looking at this at the product of the system as the customers see it whereas i think that programmers have to really be down in the code they're working on you know because it's complicated and they really have to be focused on a narrower area and uh and so the business people also have a larger view but they don't always know how to convey that mm -hmm. to the technical people or they make assumptions you know my my first XP team back in 2000, our, our business stakeholders just assumed that we knew they wanted good performance. Mm -hmm. And they assumed we knew what the load would be in production. So we should support that many concurrent users. And they assumed we knew what security to apply and what error handling. You know, they just thought we'd take care of that. They, and they didn't mention it. And so it wasn't part of our stories. Mm -hmm. And then when they saw the end result, they're like, well, wait a minute, this is too slow or uh, no, I wanted per I wanted role based permissions in the security, you know, all these things that they just thought we would get by some kind of mind meld process. And so as a tester, helping to facilitate those conversations is one of the ways I feel like I can add a lot of value and bring in things like, you know, we have so many frameworks now, like Jeff Patton's story mapping to, to slice our feature into stories mm -hmm. and Matt Wynn's example mapping to take a story and understand the goal, the business rules, examples for the business rules. And you know, that was transformative back in 2003 that Brian Merritt came up with example driven development, which unfortunately at the time that name didn't catch on, but but behavior driven development, acceptance test driven development, guiding development with those business facing tasks, I think is so important and really helps teams eliminate the rework. The stories mm -hmm. aren't going to be rejected by the product owner because they understand what to build. And the other important thing that I've experienced is when as a team, we invest time to really learn that business domain, to sit mm -hmm. down with, this is something I learned from Mary and Tom Poppendy, sit down with those business people understand their jobs, uh, you know, sit with the customers and work people, understand the customer pain. And then when the business comes with us, that I want this feature and we can determine what their goal is. Mm -hmm. A lot of times we can say, well, you know, we can do 80% of that. The extra 20% will take us, you know, <laughs> half, a, you know, twice the time. Mm -hmm. And we don't think you need that extra 20%. We think this minimum is all the customer really needs. And they go, wow, yeah, that's fine. And that's why teams look like they're going fast. Because yeah. they're doing less. Because they're eliminating all the extra that doesn't need to really be there. That they're waste, yeah. And on what's the business problem to be solved? How can we implement this technically to solve the problem you know, at the most efficient way? So those are all, you know, always I feel like 
I add value as a tester. Of course, exploratory testing is super fun, especially done in pairs or groups. I, yesterday, I I just you know had this great experience of we we were working on an epic. It was a small epic, but it was a you know a risky or you know a risky change in terms of you know uh, experience for the customers and mm. and um, so the other tester on my team and I had you know brainstormed about the risk with other people and 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 then put together some exploratory test charters based on mitigating those risks and you know we had those charters as subtasks in a jira story mm -hmm. and i try to time the, i try to frame the charters focus them on something that can be done in 30 minutes or less and so we got i think we had uh, five charters and six people got in a zoom room and we were done in 25 minutes because we <laughs> yeah. divided and conquered. And you know, this is where we can add a lot of value. It's like we did a what I hope is a great yeah. job of testing, but it didn't have to take a lot of time. It was you probably know? fun and motivating. Like, you know, yeah. accomplishing that in half an hour mm -hmm. is like, okay, let's do more of this, right? Yeah. Uh. And, you know we didn't find any problems so that was great but if we had found a problem it's like woo, good we found it now <laughs> yeah. um well that's also sometimes not sometimes but a lot of times it's it's motivating too and it, it also brings that trust with the team when you even run into issues and you figure them out together mm -hmm. it's all about that trust and relationships mm -hmm. um i wanted to get your thoughts on um just using gherkin or using you know hypothesis driven or test driven um the essentially requirements to help testing and development a lot of times you know uh, it, i tell people it's about using a common language mm -hmm. you know uh, mm -hmm. across business customer all the way through development um what uh, tips or maybe uh, uh words of wisdom would you share with the uh, with the audience about just importance or maybe for, if you see the importance of using that type of uh way to to have a conversation i guess and mm -hmm. to uh, get on the same page yeah i remember brian merritt referring to this years ago as project creole you know we <laughs> developed this common language as you say uh well in the it is important to, def, to define the business terms so this uh this epic we were testing yesterday in this document where we kind of brain dumped everything we knew about you know because it was a it was functionality none of us were very familiar with and we were changing it and so we kind of just dumped everything we learned about it but the top section ended up being the terminology section it's like <laughs> we're not familiar with these terms so let's all agree on mm -hmm. what they mean because like any business oh some people refer to it as this and some people use this other name yeah. so so that that's important and i personally really like concrete examples like give me an example and if possible draw it on a virtual whiteboard <laughs> yeah. of what's going to happen this user has these characteristics this persona and they're going to come in and do this and what's going to happen that's what I feel like helps teams the most. But I think anything that com combines some visuals, whether it's you know just flow diagrams or story maps or mind maps or you know sticky notes on a on a mirror board, whatever it is, I think those are really important. Um, I think you know always being focused. Well, I think getting this features carved up into small stories that can be done quickly so that you mm -hmm. have a more predictable pace is super important and something that teams really struggle with mm -hmm. but once you have that little story it's like what is the purpose of this particular story what's the value to the customer because as a tester i've been guilty of somebody gives me say we're, we think we're done with this will you test it i immediately go off in the weeds and find some <laughs> terrible problem <laughs> because i know where to look but that's not something the customer is going to necessarily do. I've had the developers have to say to me, Lisa, could you just test the happy path for <laughs> make sure it works at all? Yeah. Um, and, and so it helps me to focus on what's valuable to the customer. Of course, we're concerned about those edge cases if they would impact the customer in a bad way. Yeah. And, and um, 
and but just using those examples really helps and then also knowing the business rules because we can't cover every everything with just examples um something i learned from matt Wynn very well so that's what helps me the most but i just think there's so many there's so many approaches i just i'm big on visuals i think they help us keep our conversations focused using some kind of visual model mm -hmm. um Rob Meany is a, is a, a, my friend Rob Meany. He's really great with diff, different visual models to help you talk about risk or, you know, help you talk about customer pain or, or whatever it is. And those keep us focused. They shape our conversations because when you get, you know, eight people in a, in a zoom call and just talk, you can end uh. up just going around in circles. And I think th that also reminds me of, you know, individuals and interactions over process and tools. Well, mm -hmm. process and tools help us, right? Like mm -hmm. having that uh, common uh, vocabulary, having, you know, those visual tools, all of those help us communicate and, and collaborate better. And like, you know, based on what I'm hearing you say, it really comes down to communication and collaboration mm -hmm. and using these tools to have more richer uh, an effective way to communicate and collaborate to, at the end of the day, obviously deliver what the customer uh, perceives to be valuable. Mm -hmm. um, maybe uh, we got uh, 10 minutes left. I wanted to get your thought on a couple more questions. Uh, what does test coverage mean to you? And uh, how do you know if you have enough test coverage? Oh, that's such a, a, a great topic. <laughs> People... <laughs> feel comfortable if they feel if they to have a high test coverage. Uh, it can be quite misleading. Um, you know, you could say you have 95% test coverage and that might only mean that 95% of the lines of code are exercised as the tests run. It doesn't mean there were assertions on all of them. So I think you have to be clear what you mean by that. I think the trend in it is more important. Um, I remember a team I was on back in the back in the not the noughties as they call them um we decided to look at our test coverage first like let's get a baseline okay we're at 70 percent of test coverage at the unit level because we were doing test driven development but we had a bunch of legacy code that was developed without that it wasn't very well covered and and so we set a goal it's like okay in the next couple months let's get that up to 73 percent and we did and okay, let's get it let's get it up and we just started watching the trend sometimes it would go down because we ripped out some code that happened to have tests but we weren't using <laughs> that code anymore right uh -huh. um but we got it up to not even that high i think it's a 76 percent and we thought at this point it's kind of diminishing returns if this is all we're focused on it's not leading us in the direction that we need to go as a team we want to keep it there but that's not our focus it's a lot it was a lot harder back then there are probably tools now that well, I know there are tools now that can measure your test coverage at like API level and UI level, but back then that, that really wasn't a thing. Um, so, so, so my team right now that where I work, um, we have those numbers mm -hmm. at, at all our, all the levels and, and they're pretty high, but, you know, having a lot of tests, like, let's say a lot of UI level tests. Well, Let's face it, as good as our technology gets, and I and I really love the newer generations of UI tools that, you know, use heuristics to auto heal the tests and maybe use some machine learning to spot visual problems or whatever it is. Uh, those are great, but we're still plagued by tests people wrote a few years ago uh, that are flaky and hard to understand, and we that's a big investment of time to keep them maintained, and so it's a trade-off and we have to question, do we really need these tests? Are they providing us value? Mm -hmm. And it's just a continual struggle, but I, I think it's more important to watch the trends and understand the trends. So if our coverage number goes down and if we know there's a good reason for it, then, then that's fine. Um, if it stays steady, that might be fine too. So I think that's just something the team needs to continually revisit. Mm -hmm. Great. And I also just maybe to add to that, I think it's also from a business perspective, uh, understand it. You don't necessarily have to be in the weeds, but just understand it um, enough to, to, to 
<laughs> you know, encouraging teams to make the right decision. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. The, the last question that maybe is tied to, to this or is tied to this, uh, the role of our bias that plays into testing and everything mm. that we do. That's one of my favorite topics. <laughs> <laughs> so I left it. I didn't know that, but uh, uh, yeah. what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. Well, obviously, you know, unconscious bias is, affects all kinds of aspects of our business. And we know that businesses that have a more diverse uh, group of employees are more successful and make more money. And my, I don't know this as why, but my theory is that we have different unconscious biases. And if we have people with different backgrounds and culture and experiences, then we'll all work together and, and see more problems. From a testing perspective, yeah, I mean, I'm totally subject to you know, confirmational bias. Like I know how it should work and that's what I see. (laughs) Um, Availability bias, all those things are really, really difficult. And I've done, you know, I've done quite a bit of research and and, and done workshops on this uh, conferences with Stephanie Desby and Rachel Kibler learned a lot from them that they've done a lot of research on that area. Uh, Joao Proenza has done a lot of uh, research and, um, but what I, you know, there's no real, it's like nobody can say, well, how do you solve this problem? Because what I've learned from my research is they are unconscious biases. We might be aware that we have them. Uh, Awareness is not enough to overcome them. Mm-hmm. So I just think that diversity is the key. We need to hire a diverse group of employees. And Bruce Hughes did a keynote uh, at Agile Testing Days in November, my first in-person conference. <laughs> <laughs> it's awesome and so safe. Uh, and, and, and she made a really great point that not to say that testing is a profession that doesn't need skill and anyone off the street can do it, but it is a profession where we can bring people in if they have curiosity, if they have good communication skills, good collaboration skills, they can quickly learn the skills they need to be a good tester and part of the team. And this is what, you know, this is an example of where we can remove the gates. Mm-hmm. We don't have to say you need a computer science degree or you need X number of years experience or you need coding experience. We don't have to say those things. We can just look at the other, uh, uh, you know, human skills that we know are so important, the thinking skills. And, uh, and I think that that's really important. And that's something I'm trying to, since I heard that, I, that's something I'm really trying to encourage. I'm, I'm reading a, 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 a new book that's coming out that's, you know, aimed at, uh, a brand new tester or people who want to be a tester and here's what you need to learn and it's like this is perfect because having a resource like that that points you off to here's good places to get courses you know we have test automation university offering free <laughs> some university level courses there we have ministry of testing we have you know trending we have all kinds of organizations around the world offering this sometimes free or sometimes a, you'll have to make a, a subscription or, or it'll cost you something but we can get these resources that were not there 10, 20 years ago. Mm-hmm. So people can learn these skills. And it's most important though, that they already, the skills that they need, the things I hire for are attitude, mm-hmm. mindset. Um, I think you have mindset right behind you in your Zoom background. Mm-hmm. Um, are they curious? Are they willing to do anything that the team needs just to help out the team? Are they willing to learn? Uh, are they are they good at learning? And that's what I look for. And the technical skills I could teach to them. Yeah. It's not hard. Or they can learn it some other way. So the attitude is way more important. And um, and I think that's going to help us overcome the bias because we can get people from a whole lot of different backgrounds uh, and work together. Yeah, I, I always, you know, my answer would be, you know, uh, help people be more aware. But like, you know, like you said, it's just not enough. It's what happens when you have diversity is that, uh, and you have that trust. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. People will say, well, Lisa, you know, from my perspective, I think you, you're looking at it that way. And it, it's almost like, you know, uh, I can be aware of my bias, mm-hmm. uh, but it, it, there's not enough push. But when somebody else almost puts a mirror and, you know, kind of shoves it into my face and says, look, <laughs> Uh, it, it, you know, this is not, you know, the way that I see it. It's almost mm-hmm. like a little, uh, not, it's bigger than nudge, but it's almost like a little wake up call. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, oh yeah, maybe I need to step back here and kind of check my bias. Mm-hmm. So uh, having that diversity uh, to expose those biases and then mm-hmm. having the trust uh, to actually be comfortable um, to to to, um, to have that conversation with the team members is yeah, because uh, it can be hard to be the only person in the room who's having a thought. Like nobody else <laughs> is saying this. Do I dare to say it? <laughs> exactly. You know. And I mean, I, I fall, I fall into that kind of thing myself. So yeah, it's super important. So, but it's important to educate ourselves about the different kinds of bias and important to try to achieve that diversity. And it's hard work. It's hard work to expand our, our hiring pipelines and get mm-hmm. people who aren't fitting the mold. Yeah. Great. Well, we're almost at time. Um, so in closing, what would you like to leave us with a message or anything that you would like um just just i i hope that people can uh really realize this software needs a holistic approach and that's a really good way to to tackle it um yes we need our specialties we need our people with the deep skills right but collaboration and communication are really key we have to work together so we need leaders we need people with the coaching skills and consulting skills to to even internally to the team to help us learn what we need to learn, to help us work together, to help us guide us in doing experiments. I like, you know, Linda Rising's idea of small for little experiments. Let's try something, see how it works. Let's look at our biggest problem and, and work on that. And uh, yeah, I think that holistic approach is what I'd like people to keep in mind. <laughs>